Okay, well, let's get started. Uh, hi, I'm Nikki Kinloch. I'm the CEO of Cure Cancer. Thank you for taking the time to join us on what is our sixth lunch and learn session of this year with Dr. Peter Georgeson, who's based at the University of Melbourne. Um, bowel or colorectal cancer is sadly the second deadliest cancer in Australia, posing a huge burden on our health system. The good news is, however, it is preventable with appropriate screening. Uh, bowel cancer can be prevented by removing precancerous polyps uh, via colonoscopy, and people who have had these um, are at an increased risk of developing subsequent uh, polyps or adenomas uh, or bowel and or bowel cancer. Um, unfortunately, this risk is not well understood. The process is not well understood, and this complicates the screening guidelines that we currently have. Um, so what we're talking about today is very much the incredible work that Peter is doing on this um, and looking at how his research may be changing the face of treatment. Our session is going to be 45 minutes long. Um, there is a chat box at the bottom there. If you have a question for Peter, please uh, don't hesitate to pop it into the chat box um, and we'll weed that into the conversation as we go along. Um, but first of all, a warm welcome to you all and thank you for joining us, Peter. Thank you, Nikki. So, nice <laughs> um, before we start about cancer research, um, you are one of our newly funded researchers for this year, so many people on this call may not know you. Um, do you want to talk a bit about yourself and, and how you got into cancer research in the first place? Yes, absolutely. Um, yes, yeah, so maybe um, somewhat differently to many research is I didn't actually start out um, as a cancer researcher or even in research. Um, I initially um, studied software engineering and mathematics at the University of Newcastle in New South Wales, just north of Sydney. Uh, and um, you probably know that Newcastle is actually very big. Um, pre previously, it was a very big mining town um, with BHP being the main company there. Uh, so um, my very first job was actually with BHP working as a software engineer. Um, monitoring their blast furnaces to generate alerts if anything went wrong. Um, <laughs> that is Very totally different. different. <laughs> yeah, totally different to what I'm doing now. Um, I also spent some time over in the UK working uh, in a startup um, that actually ended up becoming the very first UK-based online payment provider, like a UK version of PayPal, mm -hmm. um, and then came back and uh, did some consulting for Oracle Explosives, which um, was, again, um, similar to BHP writing um, simulation software, this time for um, looking at uh, the way um, simulating how blasts are likely to evolve. So um, when Oracle explosives, if they want to build a tunnel or something, they would usually want to get some kind of idea of where things were going to fly, like where rocks might go, how far back you need to stand. Uh, so um, that was one of my, my previous jobs as well. Um, but then for... Um, I was kind of prompted to change careers basically by just seeing what was happening in um, the world of genomics. Uh, I was kind of inspired seeing how we were able to um, start to observe DNA changes and to understand disease better at a DNA molecular level, um, giving us like way more understanding of what was happening than ever before. Uh, so I actually enrolled in a Master of Bioinformatics at the University of Melbourne part-time and eventually um, I, uh, I got a job with Melbourne Genomics Health Alliance, uh, which is a uh, alliance of a whole bunch of um, organizations uh, that were um, focused on bringing some of the research results from genomics to the clinic. Mm -hmm. So where they could have impact on, on um, people. And uh, their focus again, wasn't on cancer, but I had, I was able to gain a lot of experience in genomics analysis. Uh, they were more focused on childhood diseases, mm -hmm. uh, which I also found very rewarding, um, being able to see actual impact of research. Um, but then I went on to, um, to start a PhD in 2018, uh, which was focused on bowel cancer uh, um, at the University of Melbourne. And um, yeah, the focus there was really on this concept of um, mutational signatures, which is uh, really looking at um, these patterns of um, how tumors evolve and how um, the DNA is affected by tumors. And using this, you can kind of figure out the history of how a tumor has evolved over time. 
and with that idea um, to figure out um, what kind of people are at risk and um, what kind of treatment is likely to be effective and really just understanding uh, the way tumors evolve. So um, that was really the focus of my PhD and then I've gone on now to become a postdoc um, and funded by, by Cure Cancer for this, this project. Look, it's, um, it's lovely to have you here and, and thank you for explaining your background. Um, in my introduction, I talked about how sadly it's the second deadliest cancer, but can be entirely treatable um, if it is caught early. Um, we also talked about polyps and a few other longer words there, but in, in lay term, mm. could you just explain one, what a polyp is and why it is a, pre a potential precursor to something more serious? Yeah, so, um, so that's really this kind of, um, so even though, like you said, bowel cancer is a, a huge health burden. Um, and another thing um, that has become a really big topic is that it's actually increasing in incidence mm. in young people as well, which is really alarming. Um, but yeah, as, as you said, it's actually one of the most preventable cancers, and that is because most bowel cancer comes through a polyp first. So it's preceded by a polyp, um, which is this... Um, it's a growth on the inner lining of your bowel, um, kind of looks a little bit like a mushroom, mm. sometimes compared to like, like a wart kind of thing. Um, but most of them are not um, malignant or cancerous, and most of them don't go on to become cancerous, but almost every bowel cancer does come th from a polyp. So um, the advantage of that is that if you can remove the polyp, then that stops the bowel cancer from developing. So that's really... I guess where the uh, focus of my project is is looking at that. Absolutely. And I mean, I, I'm sure a lot of people here would be familiar with, with the polyps, but um, the risk of then going on to develop bowel cancer is not very well understood at the moment. And obviously that complicates screening guidelines. We were talking to another bowel cancer researcher recently who was talking about the need for the the reduction in age for the screening program and as you've just mentioned you know we are seeing an increase in young people getting bowel cancer it's it's certainly been in the news um there's a question here and i don't know if you can answer it but why do we think we've seen an increase in in the younger population getting bowel cancer so that is a really good question and it's a really hot topic actually at the moment so the short answer is that um we don't know we don't really know what the cause is. There are lots of hypotheses. Um, uh, probably, so I've heard quite a few. There's one that is the changes in our diet. Um, so the increase really kind of kicked off in the early 90s. And there's a lot of speculation that it's because the Western diet and we're not eating as well. Um, so And there are already links to diet to uh, bowel cancer risk. So there's a um, I guess there's already some evidence that it may be due to that. Um, and that kind of leads to changes in our, um, our microbiome, our gut bacteria. Uh, and those changes, there's speculation that um, the gut bacteria may be getting out of whack. And so um, it's kind of creating this environment that is more conducive to bowel cancer developing. So that is one kind of theory that a lot of people are looking at. There's a few others around. So one is, another one is that um, this kind of rise in microplastics everywhere. Um, they've done quite a bit of research and shown that it's getting in, it's getting into everybody's um, digestive system. So it could be something to do with that. But at the moment, it's really an open, open question. Yeah. Well, I mean, it also indicates why it's so important that the, the work that you are doing as well. Um, so let's dive into that work then. Um, could you talk in lay terms, what, what are you looking at? Um, uh, you mentioned this word genomics. Um, maybe that might help if you explain that to the audience, first of all, what that is and why it's so important in, in what you are doing. Yes, absolutely. So it has really been the focus of a lot of my research. Um, so basically, um, cancer is a disease of the DNA. So it's when there's been something has gone wrong with your DNA. Uh, and when we talk about the genome, we're really talking about all of your DNA. Um, so, you know, my focus has been on um, specific, so cancer will normally develop when there is some specific change in your DNA. That means that that particular cell 
will start to replicate um, way faster than it should be and start to, so that's where you get these growths of polyps and then more changes will happen in the DNA that causes even more kind of um, accelerated growth and that's when um, cancer can develop. So my focus has really been on understanding how these changes can lead to cancer. And I guess the thing that is really drew me into this area is that we've never before been able to really look so closely at what is actually happening inside the cell. Yeah, that's really interesting. And, um, you know, you've touched on the fact that some people get polyps, but that they don't turn out to be cancerous. And in fact, it never becomes cancer, whereas unfortunately for some other people, it does. So this is all down to your change in in individual's DNA and that, that evolution turning it into a cancerous cell. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, so the current um, screening guidelines, if you do get a colonoscopy and they find polyps, uh, the current way they kind of assess, because most polyps, like you said, most polyps don't actually become cancerous. Uh, so they look at the physical characteristics and if, the, if you have multiple polyps or they look quite large or if they look kind of unusual, then you'll probably be asked to come back for another colonoscopy in a much shorter amount of time. Mm -hmm. um, whereas uh, I think normal risk people, expectation is that a polyp will take at least 10 years to turn into cancer. Uh, so there's a really big difference in a normal polyp and the ones that are actually going to become cancerous. Uh, so yeah, they at the moment they look at the physical characteristics, um, but there's a lot of uncertainty about just how effective that is. Um, with some research suggesting that uh, up to a third of those people who are asked to come back um, in a much shorter amount of time, even as short as one year, up to a third of those people are really just at a population risk and they really don't need to be getting so many colonoscopies. Yeah. Um, so the problem with that though is that um, there is a really high demand for colonoscopies and there's actually waiting lists that are quite long. So it does kind of mean that people that really should be getting colonoscopies they're the ones that are missing out. Um, and so potentially it's going on to develop cancer just because they haven't been able to get a colonoscopy in time. So yes, my focus is on the genomic side of it. Um, so there's been lots of research already, including some of my own, um, showing that when you look at the um, DNA changes in uh, a cancer, you can often infer um, how it is likely to evolve, um, uh, how it developed, whether um, it's come from um, family risk. Mm -hmm. So um, so my research is, to, is really to apply that same approach to polyps. So we look at the DNA changes in the polyps. And then we do have in our data set people that did go on to develop bowel cancer and people that didn't. So the plan is, is to look at differences between um, the DNA in those two groups of people to identify um, yeah, changes that are, are leading particular polyps to develop into cancer. And so based on that, um, we hopefully can identify high-risk people and then they'll be the ones that get this um, appropriate surveillance and yeah, people that don't need this like super aggressive um, like colonoscopies every year, they don't have to do that. Yeah, it makes a lot more sense, doesn't it? And then it also cuts out the waiting list and also the cost of the, the public health sector of, of people mm -hmm. coming in. Exactly. screening when they may not need to as exactly. well. Yeah, so um, so Bowel Cancer Australia recommend if you develop symptoms of bowel cancer, you should get a colonoscopy within 30 days. Mm -hmm. But actually the waiting lists in every state are um, over four months. Wow. So it would be, this is definitely a growing problem. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Thank you. I'm just going to pause there and welcome. We had a couple of new guests. Uh, thank you for joining. We're talking to Dr. Peter Georgeson at the University of Melbourne on his work with bowel cancer. If you do have a question, pop back into the comments box there and I will use it in our conversation. Um, so what does your day look like for those that um, have ever been into the lab or mm -hmm. understand what a researcher does? Could you help by explaining what, what you do from a day to day basis? Yes, absolutely. Um, so I do have a, photo, a picture of the lab behind me, which is actually the lab that I'm based. Um, but I am actually primarily computational. Uh, so most of my day is not spent in the lab. Um, when I first started, my supervisor thought it would be 
quite helpful for me to spend some time in the lab and with this idea that oh, maybe maybe Peter will do some lab work. And the very first thing I did was put the lab coat on backwards. And so <laughs> it was um, it was a fairly short amount of time when my supervisor thought maybe maybe Peter's better um, <laughs> at the computer. So um, I spend most of my time on the computer and actually um, the data that's generated um, by this kind of work, so genomics, it generates masses, a huge amount of data. So, um, you know, uh, we've got terabytes of data that we need to analyze. Uh, so um, you can't, um, you know, with that amount of data, it's really difficult to, um, to see directly what you're looking at. So I spend a lot of time um, working on summarizing and visualizing um, these kind of results. And um, I work in a, a multidisciplinary team. So there's people with lots of different um, skill sets as, and as well as people that work in the lab. So they understand the biology really well. Um, so we, I'm often generating visualizations and we're um, interpreting and looking at them and um, figuring out um, what we think is happening mm. uh, in this data set. Um, we also spend some time, so part of working in the lab is generating reports to clinicians as well, which um, uh, ultimately ends up affecting um, outcomes for patients. So I feel like that is also an important part of, of what I work on. Yeah, absolutely. We, we talk about this a lot here at Cure Cancer, that um, many people don't understand that most researchers actually aren't involved with the patient there they're in they're in the research lab or in your case um looking at a computer and analyzing data sets so um we do have a few researchers that are also clinicians but the the work and the relationship between the clinician the patient and the researcher is incredibly important isn't it um, yeah it's been um that's actually been a really rewarding side of, um, of my work. So we do have some patients, some consumers that we um, talk to quite often. Mm -hmm. uh, so they uh, often come to our meetings and discuss things from their point of view, um, which for me has, I guess it just really brings home um, the, the, the value of what we're working on. So for me, that's been a really important part of this work. And where do you get the data sets from? Obviously, these are, these are patients' data, but are they? And you've talked about how some go on to develop cancer and some don't. Are these um, just Melbourne-based? Are they across Australia? Are they international? Uh, so I haven't been directly involved with any of the recruitment, but there are some really big studies: um, the ACCFR, Australian Colon Cancer Family Registry, mm -hmm. which um, I think was established maybe thirty years ago. So it is one of the actually one of the biggest data sets um, in, in the world for, for bowel cancer. Uh, so most of the data uh, comes from comes from the ACCFR. So that's that's the main study. So they um, all of the ones in my my um, cure cancer grant are all uh, based in Australia. Lovely. Okay, thank you. Um, we've got a couple of other questions as well. So um, one question in regards to um, screening and why, if you know the answer to this, but why um, is it that it, you, it's for people more in more senior of age if it seems to be affecting or we're seeing a growth in the younger people? Yeah, so age, age is still um, one of the biggest risk factors. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, basically just as you continue to age, um, I think, yeah, I think your immune system and bo your body just that is not as good as dealing with these kinds of issues. So your risk does continue to increase. I think it kind of ramps up a bit around the age of 50 um, and it just continues to increase. Um, but the screening that has been implemented in Australia um, has done an amazing job of um, reducing uh, bowel cancer incidence in the older population and, and um, like the FOBT test that you get at the age of 50, which is now 40, reduced to 45 just recently, but that has had a really big impact. Um, and there's much better screening, I think, in place for older population. Um, whereas, so even though your risk is actually still quite a bit lower um, if you're younger, um, that incidence has been increasing, whereas the incidence in older people has been decreasing. 
Yeah, lovely. Thank you. A couple other questions that have just come in. Um, are there any connection between gastric polyps or tumours and bowel ones? Mm. <laughs> So I'm definitely not an expert outside of the bowel cancer um, sphere. I expect that there would be similarities. Um, I think you you can get polyps in definitely in different um, tissue across your body. Um, I haven't spent a lot of time with other types of polyps. Um, I expect I expect that there is definitely a relationship between them. That yeah, they would, would probably develop in a similar kind of way. No problem. Understand. It's not your area of expertise. Um, another question that might not be for you, but um, <laughs> are there any similar uh, symptoms or trends that you, as as a, a patient, you should look out for um, that might signal that there's something wrong um, with with you or or you may have polyps? Yeah, so I think, um, so yes, I'm not a medical practitioner. I should say, say that up front. Um, but I think that Generally, any kind of change, unexplainable change in, in bowel habits mm. is something to be concerned about. And um, quite often um, polyps, um, because yeah, they're kind of sticking out of your bowel, they'll, they'll get bumped and stuff. And so they tend to generate blood. Yes. So um, I think anytime there's blood, um, that would be uh, time to go and see a GP, definitely. Um, yeah, so I think they're the main, the main symptoms. Um, yeah, which is what that FOBT test is based on, is based on detecting blood in your stools. Yeah, makes sense. Lovely. Thank you. A question here about your patient groups. Um, are, are, is it segmented, for example, um, are they from inflammatory bowel disease patients or other high risk types of patients um, or is it a cross, cross section of all types of patients? Um, I don't think we have any of the high risk patients. I, our, so yeah, like, like IBD, for instance, um, I'm pretty sure I would have to check, but we try to make it as homogenous as possible just so that there's no um, biases. Um, so yeah, we don't want, um, we, yeah, we don't want the data set to be biased by any particular group. Um, so at this stage, I don't think there's any of the extreme, um, yeah, high risk, um, yeah any of the high risk people in this group. Yeah, lovely, thank you. Um, so what would you say are your biggest difficulties or your biggest challenges? I'm sure there are many, but what are your biggest ones in your day-to-day -day research? Uh, yes, there are a couple I could probably mention. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so definitely funding is a really major, um, a really major effort has to go into getting funding. Uh, so that was, I was there's something that I have really noticed about switching from industry into an ac academic career. Um, all the other places I worked, you just focus on what your actual job is to do, which for me was being a software engineer. Whereas, yeah, so there'd be other people in the organization, salespeople that would do things like um, find funding. Whereas in academia, that becomes part of your job as well. And I feel like, there's not necessarily an overlap in the skill set for those two things. Uh, so funding has definitely been um, difficult, especially when there is often quite low levels of success. Um, so you'll sp spend loads of time applying for something and then miss out and not necessarily to any fault of your own. I think that's just bad luck sometimes. Um, so that I think is pretty challenging um, for lots of especially early career researchers when you don't kind of have that track record. Um, so that has been a challenge. I think I was yeah very fortunate to get the Cure Cancer Grant. So um, that's been amazing to be able to work on this project through that because without the grant, I, I think this this project wouldn't happen. So, and that would be really a shame. So that- Yeah, it is, um, it's a known problem and something, you know, from our, from our perspective, uh, the last data that we had from the government was less than, Five percent of grant applicants were funded, so um, that's just a terrible yeah, state of affairs. And given given you're doing life changing and much needed work, it's it's something yeah. that we are here to hopefully change if possible mm. as well. Yeah, um, you you also talked on about 
going to acquire the money, you know, and we've, we've touched on this before, but as a researcher, many people may not realize, but you're essentially like a small business owner, aren't you? You have to do your budget, get your funding, manage staff, manage your research, do your reports. You, you have to do a whole gamut of things beyond just your research, which obviously then takes time away from the critical research you're doing as well. Yeah, I totally agree. I was, yeah, I've been really surprised. I, I guess I shouldn't be because you hear about it a lot. Um, but it almost reminded me of like the startup startup style where there's an expectation that um, yeah, you have to kind of follow the whole the whole life cycle of of um, a project. So there's been quite a quite a bit of learning involved there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, a question then about the, your techniques that you're using. So you're looking at these big data sets, you're trying to essentially predict or come with some form of sequence of a process or a change that you're seeing to be able to identify people that may have a more more higher chance of developing bowel cancer. How, how do you do that? You know, you're looking at that data, then what do you do? What's the next step in that process? Yes, so um, basically I'm applying statistical techniques um, to compare these two groups. So I have a group um, of people with polyps that went on to develop cancer versus people who um, did not go on to develop cancer. So we have the... Look for specific um, DNA changes. And I guess at a kind of... Well, I guess not really simplistic, but really um, looking for very specific DNA changes that are perhaps um, common in one group versus the other. Um, and uh, that's the basic idea of seeing things that occur in one group and not the other. And then um, I am really focusing on mutational signatures um, because a lot of my previous work looking in tumors is where we look for these specific patterns and um, it's kind of already shown previously that these mutational signatures can identify um, the likely progression of a tumor. Uh, so my basic plan is to look at um, the presence of these different uh, mutational signatures in people that did go on to develop bowel cancer. And if certain signatures show up more often in that group compared to the other, then the hope is that this will be a like a, a biomarker. Mm. So in the future, you could test people's polyps with sequencing. And if they have this particular signature, then they'll be the ones that probably need to get um, more frequent screening compared to the other group. Yeah. And when you say signature, is, is that just that our cells mutate in different ways? Is is that what you, what you mean? Yeah. Yeah. So um, one of the common ways that cancer develops is because cells are replicating all the time and uh, they do often have errors in the replication, um, but there are these other processes that correct those errors, if, it's, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, and then, um, but if those processes that correct the errors go wrong, then you start getting all of these errors happening in the replication process. And so there's all kinds of different DNA changes happening and just by kind of bad luck, one of those will turn out to be cancer. Mm -hmm. And so those um, those kind of errors in the DNA replication, uh, they show up as these, these signatures. They're like a common, like the, the type of error is often kind of the same. Yes. Yeah. So that enables us to kind of figure out why and or how the cancer started. So this is, this is kind of the idea of um, mutational signatures. So there are a whole bunch of different um, types of signatures, and one of them is a signature for aging. So um, uh, this is kind of a really interesting part of the research is that um, some of these signatures are, uh, are related to how old, uh, actually how old you are, but it has been shown recently that our organs age at different rates. So you're so your colon, for instance, might be aging at a faster rate. And um, one of the other cure cancer recipients, um, Lachlan Fennell, he's actually looking at this specifically um, using organoids. Uh, 
And it does actually look like from my preliminary results that this could be the signature that is associated with um, the polyps that go on to develop cancer. Wow. Well, that's incredible. And um, <laughs> for those interested, I spoke to Lachlan uh, two weeks ago. So if you go to Cure Cancer, um, Clarice, I think we'll pop up the link. We have a recording of my session with him. Um, where he talked about essentially growing an organoid, which is a replication of that tumour outside of the body and be able to test on that um, over, over a short period of time rather than testing on an individual as well, which is incredible. Mm, um, this, is amazing. this is amazing advance in our, in our technology. Absolutely. A um, couple other questions. Um, how many samples are in your, each of your data groups? Uh, so at the moment, so we've sequenced some already. We have, I think it's 59 in total and 11 of those people went on to develop, uh, bowel cancer and the overall target, we're going to have 120 in total. Um, I'm actually not sure the total number that will have gone on to develop bowel cancer, but we'll try to get the, the groups, I guess, as, yeah, as equal as possible. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, and for those interested, uh, Clarice has just put up Dr. Lachlan's um, Lunch and Learn session there for viewing later. Um, so your aim would be to uh, essentially uh, have a biomarker for, for bowel cancer. Then what does that mean for a pa from a patient's or an individual in general public's perspective? Yeah, so, um, so really what my aim is, uh, is that rather than, so when you get a colonoscopy, rather than your next surveillance period being based on like a visual inspection of the polyp, um, what I'm hoping for is that uh, polyps will be DNA sequenced and then there'll be a basically a cheap test that will look for this specific um, difference in the DNA. So for instance, um, the mutational signature, do a test for that particular signature and if that is present, then that will be a, a high risk person. So they'll probably need to have higher surveillance, but if that's not present, then they won't need to have this um, kind of aggressive surveillance. Um, I mean, and that really is, if you look at the knock on effects, that's incredible because it, it will, it will fine tune the screening program and most, most likely find people quicker and, and bring them to the fore of, of getting more treatment um, yeah. before it's too late. That is exactly the hope that when you see the bow, the um, colonoscopy uh, waiting lists, I was actually quite surprised at how bad it is. Um, so yeah, if we can get those waiting lists down, then it, it kind of means that people that really do need to get colonoscopy can get that in appropriate time. So yeah, the really that overall goal is to prevent bowel cancer from occurring. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you for that. Um, we've got about 10 more minutes. If anyone has any other questions, please drop them into the chat box. Um, so we talked about genomics and obviously looking at the changes in DNA. Um, genomics is a hot, a hot topic at the moment, but it's also such an incredible advancement in scientific research as well. What else have you seen that's been um, trending or growing from a genomics perspective that you've been very impressed by? Yeah, I guess there's a few different areas. Overall, I have been just astounded by how many different advances have been kind of stemming from this genomics revolution. Um, as you already mentioned, the organoid, the organoid stuff just amazes me. <laughs> um, yeah, so like Lachlan's, Lachlan's work is super interesting. Um, and uh, it's some potential for us to collaborate, hopefully down the line, which would be really excellent. Um, I guess the other areas, um, there's a lot of movement in immunotherapy. Um, Although, so in my space, though, um, I'm really focused on prevention, and there is actually quite a bit of work in vaccine development. Um, so the idea of developing, it'll be a personalized vaccine uh, based on your kind of genomic profile, um, a vaccine for cancer, which I think would also be just an incredible, incredible thing. Um, yeah, I find that area very exciting and interesting. Yeah, look, it is, and it's it's entirely possible. I mean, if you look at cervical cancer, we've got the Gardasil vaccine that was developed in, in Brisbane 20-odd um, years ago, which is actually changing the face of, 
uh, cervical cancer and globally as well. So why would that not be possible in other types of cancer too? Yeah, it is an amazing success story. So it would yes. be incredible to replicate that across other cancers. Yeah, and absolutely. You know, uh, this is why we do what we do because we have brilliant researchers here in Australia and um, a lot of them have come from overseas because we have world, world class research institutes. But the work that you and they all do doesn't go on just to affect Australians, but it goes on to affect people around the world as well. And that's what's so critical. Mm, um, question here about collaboration. Have you collaborated with any other groups, both in Australia or internationally? Uh, yes, I have collaborated with some of the groups. So I mentioned Lachlan. So, um, yeah, we have been discussing uh, possibilities um, recently as well, um, especially since um, since that mutational signature came out as being aging related, it almost links directly into his research. Um, so I think there's, there's some potential there for, for some collaborating. Um, the other, um, main collaboration for me has been, um, the Gecko organization, which is based in the U S. Um, they, um, I can't remember what the, what the acronym stands for genetics, epidemiology, colorectal cancer, perhaps. Um, Gecko's Gecko good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but they're based in the US and they also have a very large um, data set. So um, we've been able to collaborate with those guys quite a bit. Um, and it's been really helpful to have data sets from um, different parts of the world. So, so because yeah, there's occasionally differences in the DNA um, that is based on um, your ethnicity. Yeah. So, been an important part of the research yeah we've actually um over the years of me doing these lunch and learns we've talked to several researchers that have talked about differences um in in ethnic um mutations as well which is fascinating um mm. and, and an important area to study as well yeah definitely i think it's become more and more important um as we've kind of realized um, how much of the impact they can make yeah absolutely so we've talked about the challenges but why do you do your job? What's the, what's the rewarding aspect of it all? Yeah, so um, I guess there's quite a few things that I find rewarding about this. It's really the reason that I moved across here is because across into uh, this area um, because I wanted to see the impact of my work. And so seeing some of my work translated into uh, adopted clinically, I have found extremely rewarding. So knowing that um, my work is actually affecting outcomes for patients. Um, so that's, that's a really big priority for my work is to see it translated. Um, so as I mentioned also, um, uh, having the opportunity to interact with, um, patients and consumers. So even though most of my time I'm not seeing patients, but, um, yeah, having, having those people on board, helping, um, helping our direction and, and seeing um, how this research affects them from their perspective um, is super important to me. Um, yeah, and I guess the other thing is that because um, a lot of these people, a lot of the people in the lab are actually lab people and not computing people. So uh, I do a lot of the computing work for a whole bunch of different projects in this, in this team. So I get to be a part of a lot of other projects that are happening, which is also really rewarding. Um, yeah. yeah, I'd say, yeah, it's, yeah, there's lots of positives. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and for your perspective, what's your hope for the future of bowel cancer research? Um, yeah, I, um, actually really like this question because it, um, kind of makes you think about, um, where you would like to be, like what, what your kind of end goal is. And I guess for me, it would be, um, preventing, if you could stop, totally prevent bowel cancer, I think that would be, that would be the end goal. Um, and I guess, uh, my project is one, I guess, small part of that is that if we could, if we could improve our screening so that, um, we screen the right people at the right time, because bowel cancer, we have that, that little window of opportunity of where you get the polyp and then cancer doesn't develop. Um, so that's definitely an area where I think we could get closer to preventing bowel cancer. And so, um, yeah, so really that's, that's kind of my 
optimal future. Um, but I do, I really believe that um, this genomics revolution is going to be, is really going to help us get to that point. Yeah, lovely. Thank you. Um, one last question to you. What the other researchers need people <laughs> for the samples? <laughs> Um, I would have to talk to my supervisor about, I know that there are, um, there's definitely recruitment mm. happening. Um, so I'm not directly involved in the recruiting process. Um, but I, I can, I can definitely find out. I'm, I'm pretty sure, uh, these studies are often looking for people. Yeah, absolutely. Well, um, Lisa, on that question, just drop us a, a line or, um, yeah, or our email and yeah. we will, um, once we know that answer, we will, if, um, if we can link you up with, um, the recruitment teams for those samples, we will do that as well. Thank you for your question there. Um, and finally, before we sign off, um, any last words for our donors and fundraisers here today? Um, well, basically, thank you so much for the, um, for the opportunity to do this project because yeah, it means a lot to me as well. And. I think that this project would not be possible without um, this donation and, and funding. And yeah, my belief is that it can make a direct impact on people's lives. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and thank you. Thank you for the work you do. I mean, this is exactly why we fund early career cancer researchers, because your work is groundbreaking. And if essentially we can have a biomarker, which mm. makes sure that we uh, have the right people having treatment quicker, um, then that will really change the face of, of bowel cancer um, and the impact it has, not just here, but globally as well. So thank you, Peter. I really do appreciate that on behalf of everyone here. Well done and keep up the good work. Thanks, Nikki. Um, so thank you everyone else for joining us. Um, I hope you enjoyed that session. Uh, this session will be, it is being recorded and it will be on our website next week if you wanted to revisit or, or share. If you do have any other questions uh, based on our interview with Peter here, please send us uh, an email info at curecancer.com.au and we can either pass on that question or come back to you with some answers as well. Um, please join me. At the same time, on the 27th of June for our next Lunch and Learn, that's with Dr. Eric Kusnadi and uh, Dr. Luis Costas, who will be talking about their work on prostate cancer. Until then, thank you for joining us and have a good afternoon. Goodbye. Mm -hmm.